All right, this is the one that I never hear people talking about, but that can really save you in the end. By this time, we know that teaching online independently is the gold standard in terms of keeping more of the income that you make while teaching online. However, the process of onboarding these students is really what makes or breaks this relationship. Today, I'm gonna to share seven steps that you really need to take into account when you start this type of teaching online. Now, you know it's serious when I bring my clipboard to town. So, I've got the list of seven areas that we're gonna look at today. This is part of a workbook, the all-in-one online teacher onboarding guide that I have made. You can grab that down below. Um, these seven steps are things that I've personally used in my own independent online teaching. And step seven is actually something I never heard anyone talk about before I went through some of these things. So I hope you'll stick around and listen to that one because I think that is actually one of the most important ways to keep your students around for longer. All right, let's get going. Step one is to identify your target student or audience. You might know this as your niche, and while it's okay to start out without a niche, I think it's really important to develop one over time when you have that experience so that you can better serve your students and you can actually later become more of an expert and charge more over time. Think about this with any other job. Over time, people get better and better at their jobs and they get raises over time. Why shouldn't that be the same for our industry? As we improve our craft of teaching, as we accrue more resources that can be helpful for our students, we're able to then charge more for our services. Let's get some examples of niches though, because this can feel kind of confusing at first. Um, some of the teachers that I work with in my coaching program, we talk about the ways that they might best serve their students. For some of them, they say, no kids. I don't wanna work with kids, thank you very much. So they're niching down in terms of adults. For one of them, it's B1, B2 students, and she doesn't want to work with business clients. Okay, so these are people who are maybe traveling for uh, to get a job, for fun, for just general life, being able to speak English better. Um, so she's niching down in that way. Others will say, heck yeah, I want to work with kids. So they'll focus on one area. Maybe these are level zero kind of early learners. They love the little kids. They love singing. They love bringing in all those props, that sort of thing. Um, this is where I'm a little different. I teach kind of older kids, upper elementary and middle school. We do a lot of public speaking, a lot of current events. So once you find your niche, go ahead and focus on that. Those people are out there and you're going to be better able to serve them because you're an expert in that area. Step two is the trajectory for your student. This is your flight plan. All right. You need to talk with the student themselves if they're an adult or their family and be able to outline those goals. What are they expecting you to do in class each week? What are they asking for? Here are some important questions that I always ask. I always want to know, do you want homework or post-class work as I call it? Um, do you want to have class completely self-contained so that nothing is expected outside of class? Or are you okay if I send extra work? Also, I always ask if there's something they're preparing for. Perhaps they're preparing for an exam, perhaps they're preparing to travel, perhaps they're going to interview to go to a new school, that sort of thing. Having those things in mind is really important so that you're helping these students meet their goals, be they kids or adults, and you're gonna go ahead and show your worth, go ahead and show why they're taking classes with the right people by going ahead and working with you. Step three is providing virtual scheduling options. Now, this may sound kind of like background, but it's gonna look way more professional to the student that you're trying to onboard if you have a system in place. But some examples of virtual scheduling are things like Calendly, Vey, Worky, Edison. These are all online platforms that you can find free versions of and just pop in your schedule, see the availability that you've got, you can pass a link over to your students and they can go ahead and choose what they want. And boom, there's no random Tuesday at seven. Oh, but what time zone? And the back and forth can just be maddening and very time consuming. So the idea here is to really streamline the process and get a virtual scheduling app of some sort. Step four, a pricing and payment policy. So first I would say figure out your hourly rate that you need to make as a teacher in order to meet your financial goals. Once you have that number in mind, then take into account the costs associated with teaching online. Perhaps you're paying taxes. You probably should be. Uh, paying for curriculum, paying for a platform, paying for any extra storage services, things like that so that you can provide added value for your students. 
then you're probably going to arrive at a number that is more or less reasonable for your student. Now, this is where you kind of need to stand firm, and it's difficult at first, but once you know your worth, why you're charging what you're charging, it's very easy to say, this is my rate. If you'd like it, let's go ahead and get started. If not, we can set you up with another teacher, maybe. I'll recommend some friends. That negotiation is really going to start you off on the wrong foot. So I would encourage you not to negotiate whenever possible and go ahead and stand firm on your prices. Then you want to think about how you're packaging these classes. Please do not charge per class. Unless there's a really special circumstance where you need to charge one at a time, that is not going to set you up for success in terms of cutting down on admin time and making this a long-term relationship. As someone whose kids take classes online, I know it can be nerve-wracking to fork over a huge chunk of money. That's why I always start with a group of five classes. That way, once that package of five is done, we've had a good amount of experience with each other. We can make some tweaks. I always talk with the families and say, hey, how's it going? What do you think? Would you like to change anything? And then from there, I suggest if you're okay with it, then let's go ahead and do a package of 10 classes. That cuts down my admin time by half because I'm no longer processing invoices and creating them and having that kind of email back and forth. And I'm able to then count on those 10 classes so that there's really no doubt there. That's not to say you're going to find some students who absolutely love your classes and are like, let's go do it. I have a student who is all about our classes. We've been working together for over two years now, and they buy 20 classes at a time. That's something you could provide an additional discount for. Perhaps you absorb the processing fee for that student. Something like that. Something that's just a way to say thank you. I know this to be true from experience as my own kids take class online. We started with packages of five and 10 classes and now I buy 40 classes with this teacher because it's easier for me. I don't have to think about it. And I know she's a great teacher. She's proven herself and my kids love her. Time out because it's just a beautiful sunrise moment today. Take a look at that. Wow, that is incredible. Amazing. All right, the next one is juicy. This is our cancellation and refund policy. While this seems daunting at first, if you can get some text down, keep it in a document where all your agreements are stored, copy and paste that into your conversation with the parent or student as you're onboarding, this is a super simple process and hey, it's there in writing. So the idea here is that we're both on the same page. For me, I ask for 24 hours notice and if they can't make it, under 24 hours, the class is charged as normal. However, if they do give me 24 hours or more notice, then hey, we'll just push that class to the next week. Now, recognize that this has me losing money, especially during the summer months when students are on vacation often or during the holidays when students are taking you know, weeks off at a time. So I do put a stipulation in there that there is only one forgiven or pushed back class per month. But I've heard of a really great strategy from a few other people, Ashley B. Mercurio being one of them. You can check her out. Um, she records classes. So if kids aren't going to be there, she kind of does a recorded like Dora the Explorer type class where she's prompting the student to respond or maybe complete a task while recording it. Then send the recording off. That class is completed, not in the normal way, but in a way that's at least sufficient. And you're not losing out on the income. As far as refunds, you're going to need to evaluate this on a case-by-case -case basis according to your payment method. So if it costs you a ton of money to refund something using your payment method, you may want to state that your refund policy is no refunds. However, it is transferable to a friend or family member and they can work out the financials between them. I think that's probably the simplest way, but if you've got another idea, go for it. Just take a look at any fees that might be associated with refunds according to your payment method. All right, we're getting down to the end. These last two are crucial, especially step seven, so stick around. Step six is setting up feedback routes for your students. In the workbook I mentioned before, you can actually pick up six feedback clips that I've already created for you and go ahead and pop in your individualized feedback for each of those students. That's something that's available and out there for you. However, if you're up for writing your own feedback, I think you can do it pretty quickly and it provides great added value for your classes. 
setting up these routes is what's gonna make it truly efficient for you. So whether that's an email, whether that's a WhatsApp message, a WeChat message, figuring out a way to do that efficiently is gonna be really important. One bonus tip here is that I often take screenshots during class. I'll pop those screenshots into the email or message that I'm sending and parents feel like they're kind of there. Maybe they weren't at the kid's elbow, which I prefer, but they're able to see, ah, oh, I can see that they're writing. Oh, I can see that they're talking. Maybe I've included a video clip as well. There's lots of good stuff that you can do to really um, create that rapport among families and you as their teacher. Number seven. Okay, this is the one that I never hear people talk about. It's always get the students on your schedule, start teaching them, sell them packages. However, if we're truly looking out for the long-term benefits that these students are going to experience from their time with us, I think we really need to consider this. Now, let me tell you the story of a student that I met with for about two months. We were working well. The parent had given me a plan that they wanted the kid to kind of work toward. It was a public speaking type class. I could tell the student was struggling. And so I tried to provide extra extension activities, give them some extra support, provide extra articles for them. However, nothing changed. Then out of the blue, I get a message saying, hey, it looks like so-and-so is struggling. We're going to go ahead and suspend our classes for now. And I thought, what? I've been asking. I've been giving all these extra supports. I've been asking for kind of feedback on what they are feeling about the class. What happened? This step is going to help you avoid that oh, face palm moment of like, I should have done more in order to save this student relationship. So here's the idea, create a maintenance plan. Now in that workbook, I've got a maintenance plan worksheet that you can just copy for each student and keep it in a folder for each one. This maintenance plan is going to get their goals for that moment on the paper and they can change, no worries. But the idea there is to have something that you can reference to say, okay, we're working on this, we're working toward this, we've already passed this, um, and give you a chance to plan ahead and say, okay, I think I might pull in these tools, I might use this resource, and then give them a chance to reflect on where they've been. All of this shows the value that you're adding, that you're bringing to this tutoring relationship. You're not there showing up, reading from a script, or playing some game with kids when there's actually a goal to be met. This maintenance sheet also includes space for student uh, interests, their likes. Maybe you've got a Pokemon fan. Maybe you've got a soccer fan. Maybe you've got a My Little Pony fan. You know, all those different interests are great. For adults, this might look like upcoming trips or their hopes and dreams for their future. You can write those down, keep those in mind and tie back to them whenever possible. In my experience, doing maintenance on our tutoring relationships is really gonna make them last longer and it's gonna help our students see the success that we really desire for them. All right, so what do we think? Seven steps to onboard your students. I hope you'll pick up the workbook. If you've got questions, leave them down below. I'll get right back to you. And if today's video was helpful for you, please, it would be very helpful to me if you would click subscribe and like. It is free for you and it's super helpful for me. If nobody's told you yet today, thanks for doing what you do. It's really important.